Okay, so today I want to uh, discuss so-called uh, tidal forces, their effect on satellites and rings. So far, we often talked about the force of gravity that one body exerts on another, uh, but we always took that that force uh, applies to the entire object. For instance, the force of gravity on the moon exerted by the Earth, uh, we always thought it's a single thing we have to worry about. But if you think about it, the force of gravity decreases with distance as one over distance squared, which means that the near side of the moon experiences slightly bigger pull than the far side. Okay, so there is a difference between the force of gravity exerted by the Earth on the moon between the near side and the far side. And that has an effect, it's effectively stretching the moon. Uh, and as you will see, uh, causing it to uh, be in synchronous um, rotation. The actual objects are not perfectly rigid, and if there is a gradient in the force applied to the object, then there will be a net deforming force. So as an example, imagine this unfortunate astronaut who is falling into the black hole. Here is the event horizon of the black hole, right? The gravitational pull on his legs is greater than the gravitational pull on his head because legs are closer to the event horizon than the head. The difference between these two forces is the effective stretching force, the force which is stretching the astronaut. So he's being stretched in this direction and at the same time uh, squeezed in the perpendicular direction, right? So the, the astronaut is being stretched apart. So as I mentioned, the force of gravity is proportional to one over the distance squared. Often in sciences, we use this horizontal incomplete eight as a symbol for proportional two, so that we don't need to say equal some constant and uh, times this, right? When you want to focus on how uh, a quantity depends on just single variable, then we often do this. So as I said, the gravitational pull on the legs is bigger than the gravitational pull on the head, and there is a net stretching force. That force is often called tidal force. So let's look at the Earth and the Moon. Again, we know that not only that the Earth exerts uh, the gravitational pull on the Moon, but mo uh, Moon is also pulling uh, on the Earth with the force of gravity. The forces always come in pairs, according to the third Newton's law. Okay, so again, on Earth, the side that is closer to the moon is experiencing a bigger pull. We focus here on a small part of the Earth, right? And then if you take the part of the same size, but on the opposite side of the Earth, so it's at a greater distance from the moon, it will experience less of a gravitational pull. And again, these two forces are the gravitational forces on elements of the moon, one closer to the Earth, one farther away, and the one that is closer will experience bigger pull. Both of these forces acting on Earth are proportional to the mass of the moon, according to the Newton's law of gravity, which tells us that the gravitational interaction between two bodies is proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of their distance, okay? So the forces on this piece here and this piece here are both proportional to the mass of the moon. And vice versa, these two forces acting on these two elements of the moon are proportional to the mass of the Earth. So the tidal uh, force on Earth exerted by the moon uh, is basically given by the difference of these two forces. And since each one of them is proportional to the mass of the moon, this difference is also going to be proportional to the mass of the moon, okay? So uh, the tidal force is proportional to the mass of the body that is doing the stretching. And the same here, right? The tidal force on the moon that is exerted by the Earth is given as a difference of near and far force each one of those is proportional to the mass of the Earth, and therefore the tidal force on the Moon exerted by the Earth is proportional to the mass of the Earth, right? 
So you can see from this that the more massive body, in this case Earth, is exerting the bigger tidal force. Okay, so the tidal force that the Earth is exerting on the Moon is bigger than the tidal force that the Moon exerts on the Earth. So let us look at uh, the consequences of these tidal forces. The first one, uh, uh, it causes the tides on the Earth. There are always two tidal bulges. And to understand why is it that uh, it is two, one perhaps would intuitively expect that there is only one on the side of the Earth that is facing the Moon. Uh, there are actually two. And there are also dry tides. Solid Earth itself is deforming because of the tidal forces exerted by the Moon, uh, but the deformation is much, much smaller because uh, elastic forces are holding the Earth uh, together more firmly than what is the case with the oceans, right? Water can flow and therefore it is easily deformed. So we can see these effects of the tidal forces more easily in the case of water masses. So to see why there are two tidal bulges, it is useful to actually break up the argument into two pieces. Let's look first at the near side of the Earth, the side that is closer to the Moon. On this side, that is closer to the Moon, uh, water mass is being effectively pulled away from the Earth because the gravitational force on it is greater than the gravitational force on the Earth because it is closer, the oceans are closer to the Moon. Okay. So that will cause the tidal bulge on the near side. Now, if you, we look at the far side of the Earth, in this case, the solid Earth, or this half of it, is closer to the Moon than the ocean. So basically now, the Earth is being pulled away from the water, right? Leaving water behind with this bulge. So to you put these two together to get single picture, and we get the net result uh, uh, that there are always two tidal bulges. And if the moon was covered with water or some other fluid, it would also have, for the same reason, two tidal bulges. They would be caused by the tidal force on, uh, on exerted by the Earth. One thing to keep in mind is that to see how things are changing, how many tides we have in 24 hours, these tidal bulges are always pointing to the Moon. Now, Moon revolves around the Earth once in about 30 days, while the uh, Earth spins once in 24 hours. Right? So, during one 24-hour period, how much has the Moon moved? What is its angular displacement? across the sky. Well, if it uh, covers a complete circle, 360 degrees, right, full circle, in about 30 days, then the moon moves by about 12 degrees per day. In the meantime, the Earth has spun once in the same period, okay? So the Earth spins much faster than the motion of the bulges that are always pointing to, to the moon, okay? So, for that reason, we have about two high tides and two low tides in the 24-hour period. Now, um, because the moon is moving, it has moved by about 12 degrees uh, in 24-hour period. By the time we experience the next high tide, it will be a little bit longer than half a day. So the interval between two successive high tides is about 12, 12 hours and 25 minutes. Right? So if there was a, a high tide, say 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, somewhere, say in Halifax, then the next high tide would not be at 10 in the evening, but 10.25. One effect of uh, this tidal interaction between uh, the Earth and the Moon is slowing uh, down of the Earth's rotation and recession of the Moon. Okay, 
as you can see here, the two tidal bulges, right? Uh, but because the Earth is spinning, the land masses are actually dragging the bulges slightly ahead. So the bulges not, do not really point exactly towards the moon. Uh, their uh, direction is uh, slightly off the Earth-Moon axis. So what is happening is that the moon is trying to, it's exerting the gra gravitational pull on this near bulge, right? So it's trying, trying to align it with this direction. So effectively, this force has a component that is trying to retard the spin of the Earth, right? There's a force, this component, I can break up this force into two components, one um, along this direction, uh, that passes through the symmetry axis of the two bulges and one perpendicular to it. And that perpendicular force effectively acts to slow down the spin of the Earth. At the same time, this bulge here is actually trying to pull the moon in this direction. And then this force on the moon will have a component that is trying to accelerate it to increase its speed. I could again break up this force that the bulge is exerting on the moon into component along uh, this axis that connects the centers of uh, the Earth and the moon and the one perpendicular to it. And the perpendicular one is actually trying to accelerate the moon, to increase its speed. Okay? So that's what I uh, said here. Okay? So as a result, the time that it takes the Earth to spin once decreases by about two milliseconds per century. It doesn't seem like much, but actually over the age of the solar system, it adds up to a lot. About 4.5 billion years ago, when the Earth-Moon system was formed uh, early on, our day was much shorter. It was about uh, five hours long. The Earth was spinning much faster. And because of this tidal effect, it has slowed down so that now our day is about 24 hours. So in um, 4.5 billion years, the day got longer by 19 hours. Uh, at the same time, this force that is trying to accelerate the moon to increase its speed, there's a component of that force along uh, the moon's orbit, uh, as its speed slowly increases, it goes into the higher orbit. Just like if you watch stock car races, right? If you move really fast, you come up to the wall, right? If you drop the speed, you come down. So as the uh, speed of the moon in its orbit around the Earth increases, it's going slowly to the higher orbit. Again, the moon is receding from us at snail speed, seemingly. Uh, it's just under four centimeters per year. That's about the speed at which our fingernails grow. So it doesn't seem like much. But again, if you look at the change over the entire age of the Earth-Moon system, it's quite a bit. When the moon was formed, uh, the simulations show that Actually, its distance was much closer. Uh, it was uh, uh, 22 and a half thousand kilometers. And now it's 384 uh, and 400 kilometers. Uh, now, this has um, um, an important consequence because as the spin rate of the Earth is decreasing, the spin could become unstable. You've seen, I think, people do the trick uh, by supporting the spinning plate on the stick, right? For that trick to work, the plate has to spin really fast. If it slows down, all of a sudden it will fall. So when the Earth's rate uh, slows down significantly, that could cause the instability of its rotation axis. The tilt angle of the Earth's rotational axis could become much larger than 22 and a half degrees or so. 
Now imagine what that would do to our seasons on Earth, because we know that the seasons are caused by the tilt of the Earth's rotational axis, right? So if that tilt increases by a great amount, that would just mess up the seasons on Earth as far as the latitudes on the Earth are concerned. So there could be some drastic changes in Earth's climate in the distant future if the Earth's spin rate grows much slower than it is right now. The other consequence of tidal force is uh, that Moon uh, has so-called synchronous rotation. What that means is that uh, it shows us always the same side, as I've tried to indicate here by drawing this line, right? This line, like if there was a tower on the Moon, it would be always pointing, that tower will always be pointing to the Earth. And we refer to that side that is away from us as the dark side of the moon, okay? But that's misnomer. So the moon is actually spinning, it's uh, uh, rotating, but in a synchronous manner so that uh, it always shows us the same face, right? And again, that's, called, uh, that's uh, uh, caused by the tidal force exerted by the Earth, which is trying to always lock the long axis of the moon uh, to be pointing towards the Earth. Now, if we look throughout the solar system, it turns out that the two satellites of Mars, Phobos and Deimos, also have synchronous rotation. Right? They always show the same face uh, to the uh, uh, Mars. Uh, the four largest uh, satellites of Jupiter uh, Galilean satellites, because they were first observed by Galileo, and it turns out four more, smaller ones, they also have such synchronous rotation. They always point uh, the same face to Jupiter. Fifteen satellites of uh, Saturn have synchronous rotation, and two large satellites of Neptune, uh, Proteus and uh, Triton also have synchronous rotation. Okay, so these tidal forces are responsible for the observed uh, synchronous rotation of uh, larger satellites and some smaller ones in the solar system. Next, they are also uh, responsible for volcanic activity on Io. Okay, this is one of the moons of Jupiter, Io. Uh, uh, this is the actual photograph, and as you can see here, there is a volcano. So what's going on, right? Um, why is uh, uh, Io sh showing uh, volcanic activity? Well, uh, it turns out that uh, what is responsible for it is so-called tidal heating. Io's orbit around Jupiter is eccentric. And the point of the closest approach is referred to as periapsis. Uh, in the case of planet uh, revolving around the sun, uh, it's uh, called perihelion. It's a combination of peri and heli helios for the sun. And the point of uh, where the, uh, the object has the greatest distance from um, the force of attraction is called apoapsis in general. In the case of planet revolving uh, around the Earth, it's called aphelion, right? Again, up and helios for the sun. So it's probably most appropriate in the case uh, of the Earth when we describe our moon's orbit, then this point here of the closest approach, if this was Earth and this our moon, this point would be called perigee, G for geos, uh, Earth. And this point here would be called apogee, right? Uh, uh, again, combination of uh, apo and, and geo, right? So in this case here, where we have a body, say Jupiter, and uh, a satellite, the point of closest approach is called periapsis, and the point at the greatest distance from the object is called apoapsis. Okay, so here, 
Remember, the tidal force depends just like the force of gravity uh, on distances 1 over distance squared. So here, where the distance is the shortest, uh, the tidal force is great. And it's stretching aisle, right? It's trying to pull it apart. At apoapsis, because of increased distance, the amount of tidal stretching is reduced. So when you think about it, Io is perpetually being flexed, right? Stretched and then it relaxes, stretched and then it relaxes, stretched and it relaxes. And the energy that is used to stretch it is eventually uh, converted into heat, which melts the interior of Io and is the reason why it has a molten interior and why it shows uh, volcanic activity. So this effect is called tidal heating. If you take, say, a piece of wire and then you bend it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, you will notice that the middle, the place where that undergoes constant uh, stretching, gets a little bit hotter. Okay, again, the mechanical energy that I supply with my hands, deforming it, is eventually transformed into heat. Okay. So the same uh, sort of thing is happening here.